Okay. Yeah, that turns on. Testing. Good evening. Good evening. Could we ask everyone to have a seat? Please find your favorite seat. Thank you so very much. I would like to say good evening to you. And make sure that everyone signs in at the back table. Please take time to sign in. We would also like to ask each one of you to turn off your cell phones or at least put them on vibrate. We do not want any interruptions of that nature. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge any officials we have any officials that we have here on this evening? I see, uh, who, I see one, A. Marie Young. Could you wave at us? Solano School Board. Pre president of the college. And the president of the college, I'm sorry. Yes. We're glad to have you on this evening. Any other officials we have in the house? Oh, and I... We have a supervisor in the house. <laughs> okay, thank you so very much. We're just uh, uh, a few minutes late getting started here, so I'm just going to rush along, okay? At this time, without any further ado, I would like to present to you and introduce to some. Our moderator for the evening is Eva Coley. She's the president of the African American Alliance, and we're going to give her the time now. Thank you so very much and welcome her. Good evening and thank you. Um, we're going to go through some administrative things. Um, I'm going to explain how the forum is going to work. Um, but at first I want to make an announcement. As you can see, there's voter registration forms in the back. Tomorrow's National Voter Registration Day. So I'm sure all of you all are registered to vote but you may have some family members or some friends or neighbors that's not. So please encourage them to go out and vote. The midterm elections are very, very important. Now having said that, let me tell you what the forum's gonna be, the uh, procedure's gonna be. Each candidate will be given two minutes to introduce themselves, okay? Um, and we have timers, we'll explain that in a second. Um, the candidates will be given two minutes to introduce themselves, and then we have um, three people that will speak. They will be given three minutes to speak. Each one of them will be given three minutes to speak. We're going to have someone speak on Measure E. Actually, I said three to five, so Measure E, Deborah Dixon is going to speak, um, participatory budgeting, um, Alyssa Alford, and if I mispronounce your names, you know what? My heart is in the right place. Um, and we have the candidate from uh, Solana County Community Governing Board that will speak. And then we will go into the forum, okay? And we have timers. Are my timers ready? My timers are Albert Casso and Foster Hicks. Okay, as usual, the green means you start. The yellow means that you, it's a one minute warning. You have only one minute to, to wrap it up. And the red means stop. And if you've attended the forums before, you know that when the red comes on, I don't care if you gasping for breath, we stop you. So just kind of keep that in mind because I don't want to be rude, okay? So help me not be rude. So first up, I would like to, and, and the candidates, the, the people that are going to speak, I'm going to move out the way and you can come over here so that everyone can hear you. So the first up, we have the Vallejo Unified School District has a bond measure coming up. It's called Measure E. And I would like the chair of the Committee to Fix Our School vote yes on Measure E to come up and give us a spill on Measure E to tell you why you should vote for it. Deborah Dixon.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to be here. So glad to be uh, among all of interested parties here in Vallejo. Um, I am the campaign chair for Measure E. I have the distinct pleasure of uh, being nominated by a very good friend of mine, and uh, he and I talk about that all the time. Uh, but what is Measure E? What, what, is it, what is it all about? It's a $239 million uh, bond. And with this $239 million, million we're talking about um, in construction, renovation, and upgrades to 25 existing uh, schools serving approximately 14,000, over 14,000 students. We're talking campus safety, handicap accessibility, new technology, and the STEAM program, which is science, technology, art, engineering and mathematics. Also, full service community schools and infrastructure. Well, what is this general obligation bond amount? It's currently planned to be in the amount of $239 million. And uh, it is an obligation bond, and it is based on one, 100,000, excuse me, $125 per $100,000 of assessed value. Okay, that's how it's broken down. And the figures say it will be approximately $10.42 uh, a month uh, per, ho per household. So what will happen is that we will get the opportunity. The Vallejo schools are in pretty good shape for being as old as they are. Some of the schools, um, I'm over the age of 50, and some of the schools I went there at, in elementary school, um, you know, middle school, my children have gone to those schools, and even my grandchildren have gone to those schools. So what we would like to do is bring everything up into the new millennium and use that money to fix our schools. The money is not for administrations. The money is not for salaries. The money doesn't go for anything but to fix our schools. And so that's what this general obligation bond is all about. And we're hoping that the community will really support us, come out and support us on this. It's all about the kids. It's not about us. It's not about what we think about um, policies and, and, and people. It's about the children. How do we best serve them? And in my opinion, the best way that we could serve them is to put in the best structures that we can in each and every one of the schools. There's 25 different sites. In comparison, there's a school district close by that is spending $50 million on one high school. So when you talk about $239 million spread over 25 different sites, then you know we're, we're speaking of some money. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you all for listening to me. We, I have some information, some flyers here that I'll leave. Also, some endorsement cards for my endorsement committee. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Deborah. And now I would like to bring up Alyssa Alford, who will speak to you about participatory budgeting. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alicia Alford, and I work in the city manager's office here in City Hall, primarily on participatory budgeting. Just a quick poll, how many people here live in Vallejo? Okay, 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 good. How many of you love Vallejo? Okay, good. How many of you would like to see Vallejo improve a little? Okay, good. Everyone's hand should be up. So here for PB, we actually have $2.4 million. It's taxpayers' dollars. If you pay taxes, it's part of your money. With the $2.4 million starting this Saturday, we're actually allowing you to come forth and vote on how to improve Vallejo. We have 27 projects that were proposed by residents such as yourselves in February and in March. We had community volunteers whittle them down to 27 and now we have a beautiful ballot. We have projects on the ballot from improving schools through band instruments, their funding of band instruments, from allowing students to learn more about themselves and Vallejo through sailing, to improving school electrical shops at Vallejo High School and summer and youth internships. Now, how many of us know that our kids need more jobs? Again, that should be everyone. 
So I really do encourage you to come out and vote. This Saturday, we actually have a big kickoff on the waterfront from 12 until 4. We're going to have a big tent, live music, food vendors, and you'll be able to vote all week long until October 6th. So again, I really, really encourage you to come out and vote. On pbvaleo.org, we have all of the projects, all of the information about PB and about how you can get involved. If you've ever felt that your vote doesn't matter, your vote really does matter for PB. If you're 16 years old or older, as long as you're a Vallejo resident, you can come out and vote. So again, I really encourage you to vote. This literally is your tax dollars. If you pay taxes, again, you should really have a voice in how they're spent. So again, go on pbvaleo.org, excuse me, and find out more information about the polls. And I really encourage all of you to come, tell your neighbors, vote on your favorite five projects, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the candidate for Solano Community College Governing Board, Pam Keith. Thank you. How many of you turned out for this forum tonight? I'm grateful for that. Part of the problem is apathy, people that don't turn out for things. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Pam Keith. Eva told me I had three minutes to talk about myself. I said, oh my goodness. Um, I've been on the governing board for 20 years. Somebody think, some people think that's too long. I think it's a good history. I think that Ms. Young will agree with me on that one. Um, I served on the Solano County Civil Service Commission for 20 years. I served on the Human Relations Commission for nine years. Um, I was on Continental of Omega Boys and Girls Club Board of Directors, on the YWCA Board of Directors. I, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about the college. Um, speaking of bonds, where's Ms. Dixon? Next time we have a bond, I'm going to get you to head the committee. You're fierce. Um, We've passed two bonds in the last 10 years, one in 2002 and one in 2012. And the first one in 2002, I think that people will agree, we've done a lot with. We bought three pieces of property in Vallejo. We've built a, a center on one of those pieces of property. We'll probably in the next 10 years build at least another building on that property, probably a building on the second piece of property that we bought next door to Mr. Worrell. And um, I'm not sure yet what we'll do on the third piece of property we bought across the street. But um, I think that that's the main reason that I'm running for re-election is that we just had a $348 million bond passed. And I have to tell you, it's thanks to the people of Vallejo that that bond passed that if it were up to the rest of the county, it wouldn't have. But our voters put it over the edge and gave us that money to do all of the things that we've done with that money. So I want to be there for the next four years to have some input to make sure I know that it's the whole county, just like Ms. Hannigan knows it's the, where are you, Aaron, knows that it's the whole county. But I know that Aaron will agree with me, even though you look at the big picture and the whole county, it's about Vallejo. That's who, represent, who elected us to represent them. And so I want to be there for those four years to make sure that Vallejo gets their fair share of that $348 million and that it doesn't go up county. Am I supposed to be looking at a light here? I feel like I've been up here for 20 minutes, so... <laughs> It's not time for me to get down from here yet, yeah. Foster. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope that you'll vote for me on November 4th. I'd like to do another four years and give you what you deserve as Vallejo voters um, out on Columbus Parkway and now on North Ascot and Turner Parkway and our new automotive tech center that we opened. Um, we're leasing a building from uh, Mr. Buck Camphausen on uh, Georgia Street, but that's temporary because we're going to get our own automotive tech building to state of the art. So it will be here in Vallejo hours and not rented from someone. So now I see the yellow light on. That means I can gracefully get down. Thank you. Be sure, no matter wh who you vote for, vote on November 4th, please.
Thank you, Canada Keith. And now we're going to get to know our candidates. I'm sure that some of you have been to other forums, but this is our first, so we want them to have the pleasure of introducing themselves to us. So I think I will start with Dr. Ubaldi. You have two minutes to tell us about yourself. Okay, thank you. My name is Tony Ubaldi. I'm currently the president of Vallejo School Board. I'm a retired pastor and a professor. I wish to thank the African Alliance for allowing us to have this evening for, so that the community can understand the issues that are before us. Three years ago after you, <coughs> excuse me, after you endorsed me, I have accomplished the following. As a trustee of the Vallejo School Board for the past three years, I have worked tirelessly with trustees, superintendents, staff, and community. Together, we accomplished the following. Regained local control of our governance of us from the state. Established solid financial standing. Received positive certification from Solano County Education. Instituted an independent citizens fiscal committee, audit committee. We also address safety, bullying concern by hiring site safety supervisor and enhancing security measures at all schools. Additionally, we have increased the high school graduation rate from approximately 50% 50, 50 when I entered and to last, a year before last, 66%. We expect significant increase due to the academic programs we have built on collaboration with our stakeholders, that is from last year. Established wall-to-wall -wall academies, full-service community schools, and restorative justice programs to improve student academic achievement and well-being of all students. We have improved the attendance 92% to 93%. The dropout significantly decreased by 11%. Reduced referrals and suspension and expulsion. Fiscal management. Currently, we have a 3.5 reserve. We only need 3% from the state. Reducing academic gap, 10.3 from African Americans, 65% for Latinos, and 12% white students. Thank you. Thank you. I said I needed help so I wouldn't be rude. Let's go to candidate Whirl. Thank you. I generally stay under my time limit. Uh, my name's Berkey Whirl. I've lived here in this community my entire life. Um, I worked 30 years as a police officer in this community. I know what it means to have an education. We all need to make sure that the young people in this community have a good quality education. Uh, I served on the board, uh, school board in the past. Uh, I've been off since 2001, and I still go to 90%, probably 95% of the meetings that the school board has because I am interested in what happens in this community. I'm not just running off of a whim. Um, I, most of you know me, most of you also know I go to the city council meetings because I'm interested in this community. We need to all work together to make our schools better so our children can go out and be productive citizens in this community and in this country. Uh, a lot of good things have happened in the school district. Uh, there's still more room for improvement. So I hope that on November 2nd, you will at least cast one of your votes for me because I want to represent you, I want to represent the students, and I want to represent the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate World. <laughs> Candidate Kayanga. Did I get that right? Well, good evening, and thanks for being here. And thank you to the organizers of this event. My name is Russ Gokayong Young, and I'm running for Vallejo School Board because I am passionate about public education. Having lived in Vallejo for almost 25 years, I was raised by a hardworking single mother. She taught me the value of a public education. Having attended Vallejo Public Schools, community college, and UC Berkeley, I know what needs to be done in our school district. As a former college board student trustee and city youth commissioner, I'm here to help tackle the issues our school district faces. The issues we're facing right now 
we have students and teachers being assaulted, a high dropout rate, and bullying all document not one, not two, but three Solano County grand jury reports. We have low teacher morale and flattening test scores. Fairfield Unified School District and Compton Unified School District, according to the latest data provided by the, by the state's website, are exceeding us. To fix our schools, we must elect new board members. I am your candidate for change. My name is Rusko Kayangyang. I'll be honored with your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wilson. Good evening. I am a 43-year Vallejo resident. My husband and children are graduates of the Vallejo City Unified School District. My husband and son teach in the district. My daughter has a PhD in psychology and works with chemical dependency recovery teen program children. I have four grandsons in this district. I have had children in this district since 1981. You're wondering how I did that. Because I have also been a foster parent to numerous children in this district. Through the problems, through the good times, I have not run. I have stayed and helped solve the problems. No, this district is not perfect, but it's far from mediocre. We have had an 11% increase in the graduation rate over the last three years, a steady decrease in the dropout rate. K-8 science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics curriculum, and our wall-to-wall -wall academies. I went to the ninth grade orientation at Vallejo High School. I asked parents, who formerly had their kids in the local private school. Why are you coming to the Vallejo District? They, without exception, said, we see what's happening in the district. And when the citizens of Vallejo decide that they are going to listen, to read the celebration report, and sing and celebrate the, and praise the work that has been done in this district, just as we should do for our city. If you care about Vallejo, you'll tell the truth. There are those, Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Longmiller. Good evening, thank you for coming. Good evening, red light's on. I'm Shelley Lockmiller and I'm running for school board for the city of Vallejo, the city I've chosen to live in for the last 16 years. My father's been a resident for the last, well, since the 70s. So I've been in and out and I've seen the changes, the growth, the ups and downs and the swings from high to low that our community has gone through. As a member of the Boys and Girls Club Board, past president of the Loma Vista Farm Board, city appointed member of the P Participatory Budgeting Committee Steering Committee, I am very, very committed to seeing our community improve. Coming on board as a governing member of the school board, I can anticipate joining a solid team of folks that are committed to making our community better. I bring 30 years of corporate HR experience to the table. So being able to communicate with our employees and our community is something that I'm very good at. I've been able to affect change in the companies that I've helped build. And I'm very, very happy to ask for your support to join this board. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will begin with the round, a series of questions. Um, I get to choose you randomly. So uh, I want to remind you that you have three minutes to respond. And as you can see, the yellow light and the red light do work. So first question, and let's start with candidate Ubaldi. In the world and in schools outside of the Vallejo City Unified School di District, technology is taking over our lives. What is your plan or what would be your plan to ensure that our students have the opportunity to become techno-smart? 
Thank you so much. I think it was about three weeks ago when a labor union manager, business agent spoke to me. And he said, Tony, we need your help. We're losing folks in our apprentice program and we're spending a lot of money costing us. And we would love very much for the school district to consider developing programs while in senior so that they can continue the apprenticeship after, after senior year and, and come back to us. That way it will save us some money. That similar program is available in Germany. They call it high-tech machinery and system linking together. The process specialists who oversee operation and improve their efficiency and technician who install, monitor, repair, and upgrade advanced equipment. So they're talking about skilled workers, not just workers to, to, to carry some material, but actually skilled workers that would have adequate uh, workforce support. And I have spoken to Dr. Bishop about the possibility of this, and she was very open. And also, the other, the other segment of our community, which I also served for four years, is our community college. That we need a, a, a non-disturbed, disturb, seamless program that will allow us to go from high school to community college and have that type of training because our workforce is tearing down the, the, the current jobs today are in threat because of technology. And so therefore, we need to have a program that will sustain that type of program. This is an article that I, I read recently. The top 10 jobs facing threat from technology. They're talking about letter carriers, farmers, meter readers, news reporters, travel agents, lumberjack, flight attendants, drill process operators, printers and tax examiners and collectors. It is high time that we move toward technology because technology is already changing these particular jobs. So therefore, we are now prepared, ready to help move in that direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Candidate, you have intimidated me with your name, Kayang Yang, your question. Business items, adopting curriculum, overseeing construction, and approving contracts, contracts with outside vendors are a few of the functions of a school board. What experience do you have that will assist you in being effective in one of or all of those areas? Well, having served on, on the college board as a college board student trustee, uh, we get a report from our college president superintendent that has those kind of items you mentioned, contracts, vendors, partnerships with various organizations. I know how to do my homework. I know what question to ask. And, and one of the questions I would ask is, is this gonna benefit students? What is the fiscal impact to the institution? And if, if they are positive, then yeah, I will go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Candidate Lockmiller. Did I get it right that time? Okay, I'm on a roll here. As candidates campaign and, make, and promises are made and goals are stated, do you feel that the community should have an evaluation tool to evaluate board members if, if promises aren't kept and stated goals are not accomplished? Wow, is that a loaded question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the sake of transparency, what is the harm in asking for that kind of process? The more people that are involved in telling us what needs to be done, what we could be doing better, what we're doing well is just as important. I think that that's a, a wise choice. I am not afraid of constructive criticism. It only serves to make our processes better and to open our minds to the other avenues that we may not have thought of. We're all human. The more input for the community encourages more participation and that is vital. The more parents that we can get into our classrooms that have eyes on what's happening inside those walls, the better informed they are, hence the better feedback they could give to us. We cannot be everywhere as much as we would like to try. So I'm very much in favor of getting as much feedback in a constructive, non-threatening way 
as we can possibly do. Thank you. Candidate Wilson. Do you believe that the evaluation process for the superintendent is a fair process? Why or why not? I believe that uh, the process is quite fair. It involves all five board members. And I have been on the board 13 years. I have ha uh, had to evaluate numerous times every year three different superintendents. Um, and when you're going through that process, you have the opportunity to individually meet with the superintendent. You set the goals up front. You look at um, and listen to the community. Listen to the employees. Get lots of input in addition to looking at the work and the reports submitted to the board. Regrettably, during my 13 years, I've also had to fire one superintendent, and I guess you would call, some people call it firing, we call it termination without cause to a second superintendent. So I am able to, I have 38 years of experience with the United States Treasury Department Internal Revenue Service. I am able to look at the facts, make a clear decision, but also you have to look at how the uh, critique of the superintendent, positive, look at the positive things, look at the negative things, and another critical point is how the person will accept the critique, whether they're willing to accept uh, any for improvement, whether they're willing to work and be collaborative, whether they're willing to do those things that will only make the district better. As you know, in the first year of any job, if it's the first time you've held it, you're going to evaluate the person hard. I am a hard evaluator, especially in the first year, because that's the period where you can give very constructive ideas as to things for improvement and looking for and giving direction. It's how that person also receives that, whether they're going to become combative or even crying, not willing to because they perceive themselves as perfect not being able to accept that everyone has to be evaluated. We want to look at the positives. We want to look at the needs for improvement. We want to make us great suggestions for improvement. We want to do the whole evaluation. Each individual board member participates in the Thank process. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Worrell. In the last school year, the board decided to change the mascot at Vallejo High School after receiving input from the community and others. How would you have voted and why? I would have voted to change it. It's nothing but a mascot. I know it's been there for a long time. Uh, there were a lot of people who thought it was offensive. Uh, there was no reason not to really change it. Uh, again, I understand people were tied to it because it had been there for so long. But when you have something that turns out to be offensive to, to a group of people, you need to change it. Mascot is nothing more than a mascot. I would have voted to change it too. You can always come up with a different mascot. A lot of schools have changed theirs. Some of the professional teams have changed theirs. Some haven't. There's nothing wrong with changing a mascot. Thank you. Candidate Lockmiller. A concern of some employees and students in the, is the condition of some of our schools, not enough custodians, bathrooms not cleaned or locked, no bathroom supplies, and the upkeep of the grounds. Are you aware of any of these concerns slash complaints, and how would you respond to those that are our concern? Having visited a lot of school sites over the last four years, yes, I'm very aware of the conditions. I do a lot of work at Loma Vista Elementary. 
um, at the Environmental Sciences Academy. So I'm with the kids at least every week, so I see what they're dealing with. Supply shortage, shortages, broken bathrooms, broken fixtures, having a complete uh, process to get things fixed in a timely manner is, is very important. Not only that, but it, to fail to do so is sending the wrong kind of message to our employees and our students, as if we don't care. And that's definitely not what's going on, but that's the perception. So balancing the budget on the backs of the kids for things that are fairly simple from a supply standpoint, that's not acceptable. How to address that? Make smart decisions during your budgeting process. Put the dollars and the resources into making sure that our infrastructure is sound. Part of that may be addressed by the major e-bond. That's a big ask, I understand that. But the fail to do so, again, what kind of a message are we sending to our students? They deserve a safe, clean environment. And then I would make it the responsibility of the administrators to make sure that they keep it that way. Kids are rough on buildings and fixtures, but having a preventive maintenance plan ahead of time should be able to head off a lot of the long-standing issues that we come up with. Let's give the kids the environment that they deserve, the ones that I experienced as a child in the public school system here in California. I went to school outside of the country, so I've seen the differences. differences. What we've had happen in our state in the last 30 years is unfortunate. From a financial standpoint, we had this perfect storm in, in Vallejo. Between the bankruptcy and the receivership, we had immense challenges. Having facilities degrade to the extent where we have to do major renovation, it's just not smart business. We need to be more proactive, and that goes all the way down to the toilet paper on the roll. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Ubaldi, and, and let me apologize up front, this is kind of a long one. <clears throat> it seems that one of the least talked about programs in the district is special education, specifically special day class students who are, will be entering high school. As a possible board member, are you aware of the students in the special day classes? And do you know if the district has a plan to help these students succeed once they leave the middle schools? Yes, that, that is a long question. We cut it down, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Special education is one of our most important programs in our school. We have had some ups and downs, mainly because of the lack of personnel. They are perhaps one of the toughest staff categories outside of math and science. We offer bonuses to have them come on board and we have a very challenging moment. And so that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Parental collaboration is the other forte that we are try trying to en enhance in our, in our preparation to support the children. And we plan to develop further programming that enhance that. We hired a, a director recently that has qualification that has been tested and it looks like the direction, the movement is taking place that would impact that particular program. And so far we have been pleased with the direction that our new director is, is placing. But most importantly, the biggest challenge is really finding the right staff. And that's been a challenge because we cannot compete with a neighboring district. We've done everything we can, uh, bonus, everything else that you can imagine. They would love to come here, but when they find out with the kind of uh, remuneration that we can extend to them, we just cannot compete. And that's been one of the biggest challenges that we have. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, candidate world. In the past, the district has had its share of negative publicity relating to different schools. Do you feel the district has done all they can do to change the negative to positive, or do you feel that there is more that can be done? I think there's always more you can do. If there's some type of complaint out there, then I think there's uh, more work that needs to be done. Uh, you need to not only listen to the, the public, you need to hear what the public is saying. And then you need to act on what they're saying. If you don't agree with what they're saying, then you need to speak up and say, no, that's not right. And I, I don't see any reason to do anything. But we've seen a lot of negative things come out in the press and people talking at the board meetings. So there is room for improvement. I've, I was on the board for eight years and, and there was always room for improvement. You need to listen and hear what the public is saying and then act on it in the best way you possibly can. Thank you. Canada Wilson, one of the concerns that bothers both teachers and certified staff is salaries and support. Do you believe that both teachers and administrative selves salaries are commiserate in line, is that the word? In line with other communities? Absolutely not. I do not believe that they are commensurate and in line with other communities. Regrettably, everyone knows the finances of the Vallejo City Unified School District and the city of Vallejo. We did hit the perfect storm at the same time, plus the economy nationwide hit that storm. So regrettably, our administrators are paid much less than surrounding administrators, as much as the Fairfield superintendent is paid about $60,000 more than our superintendent. Mm -hmm. The principals in Fairfield are paid about $20,000 more. And the teachers are paid anywhere from two to $9,000 more than the, than the uh, teachers in our district. And according to the classification <coughs> of our CSEA, uh, employees, which are our um, uh, custodians, our secretaries, etc., they also are paid less. How can we fix this? We need to increase the general fund. One of the ways to increase that and is to increase enrollment, and that is something that is happening in the district due to the programs that are currently offered. Average daily attendance is very important. We have increased average daily attendance and must continue to increase it. It does not benefit the city of Vallejo nor the district when there is a lot of misinformation in the community. And that's something that as a, a district, we have to work on. One of the ways that we are tr attempting to work on it is through the celebration report that has been distributed to, throughout uh, the district at all the open houses. Uh, we are getting it to all our parent community and it is on our website. But with this community, we must all be committed to finding facts, stating the facts, and telling the facts and not spreading untruths. Yes, there is a lot to work on in the district. I do not deny that. But there is a lot of positive out there. And we must, as a community, spread that and let people know so that we can increase the student number, ADA, and increase our general fund so that we can support our employees and provide them the salaries that they need to be provided across the board. All of the employees, not picking and Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Worrell, have you publicly endorsed the measure E bond? Please explain why or why not. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of it. Could you please repeat it? Have you publicly endorsed Measure E? Please explain why or why not. I support a bond measure. We need 
a bond measure to improve our schools. Uh, the state no longer gives out the money like they used to, to repair your schools, to fix your schools. So the way it's gonna get done is by uh, the local communities uh, passing bonds. That's why you see so many out there. Along with that comes a responsibility for the board to oversee how that money is spent. And that's what I want, one of the reasons why I wanna be on the board. Just last Wednesday night, the uh, school district had a purchase order uh, item on their agenda. And in that purchase item, there was several major A monies being spent. And some of those had dealings with the Vallejo Charter School. One in specific, they were using major A money to help move the Vallejo Charter School to the Springstown campus. I'm sorry, that's not what major A money was for. It was never intended for that. And after I brought it up and there was a discussion, then the spending of that major A money was uh, tabled and they're probably going to not use the major A money for that, which they should not. But that is the responsibility of the board and also the community. We all need to look at it because nobody's perfect. So we all need to be vigil, vigil on that. And when it comes up, we need to go speak on it if we think it's not right. And I did not think spending major A money to move the Vallejo Charter School to Springstown was an appropriate use of major A money. Thank you. Candidate Lockmiller. How will you bring balance between your physical responsibility as a board trustee and the social economic education and safety concern of Vallejo students? Was that too fast? Read the first part of it first. How will you, how will, will you bring balance between your physical responsibility as a board trustee and the social, economic, education, and safety concerns of Vallejo students? Fiscal, what did I say? <laughs> Got it, fiscal, Got fiscal it. responsibility. <laughs> One of the advantages of being retired at this time in my life, I'm still young enough and energetic enough to have a lot of time to spend on budget analysis, looking for other opportunities for funding streams, um, it's just ingrained in me after 30 years in the corporate world. I've run multi-million dollar businesses, so I'm used to looking at budgets and looking for ways to increase the top line and decrease expenses. I can't say with certainty that we're at the bottom of our budgetary crisis. We're certainly in a somewhat stable position, but we need to be aggressive and vigilant and overseeing uh, what we can and cannot do so that we are sustaining where we're at and not dipping back down. In order to do that, you need to have time. I have a host of experts that I've worked with throughout the country that auditing is their forte. I would also depend on my peers on the board for their eyesight and insights, as well as the expertise of our administrators. With all of us working together and keeping eyes on the most important aspects of our district, which is what happens in that classroom, then we're sure to have our priorities straight. And if we find indications that the priorities are getting out of whack with what the goals are, then we adjust. Things change, business climate changes, tax base changes. We just need to be on top of it every single opportunity that we have. In a balanced way, we, have to, we just have to look at how are we spending our dollars the most efficiently? Not justifying programs and increasing their funding just because it's the status quo. Challenge the programs. Make sure that we're getting the results that we expect for the dollars that we're able to spend and willing to spend. Reforming government and bureaucracy, that's, that's a really big task that's ahead of us, but it's one that I'm prepared to do. I've had to do it in my work life. It's not easy, but it's also one of the most rewarding things that I personally had experienced having done it well. I fully expect to bring those skills to our board. Thank you. Candidate Kuyang Yang. Your turn. 
A, com a community school board has a large influence on the community that it's in or represents. How do you plan on presenting the issues and concerns of parents and loyal citizens to the community and outside of the district? While serving on the college board, I held office hours with students and community members. Whenever a proposal comes before the board meeting, I, I talk to various students and community members. What do you think of this proposal that we're going to vote on? And I can tell you, their input has been very helpful in, in the decisions that I have supported. That's the kind of leadership I would bring as your school board member, holding office hour, regular scheduled office hours with you to hear your input before a major decision comes before this school board. In addition, I would make unannounced and announced visits to school sites and get the feedback from students and teachers and ask them the same thing. What do you think about this proposal coming before the board? And finally, I would advocate for ch changing our school board meeting time and place to be closer to you, especially those that use public transit. The, the board meeting times are at 5 p.m. and usually on Mare Island. It makes it difficult for many parents to make it out there. I'm going to help change that so that you can particip participate more and hold the board more accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Worrell. Do you believe that teachers and staff have the right to, right to disagree with administrative and board decisions without fear of repercussions? Absolutely. That's one of the fundamental principles in this country is you can disagree with somebody and you shouldn't have to worry about retaliation. We know in the real world there is sometimes retaliation taken against uh, an employee when they say something. Uh, it's the job of the board to make sure to the best that they can that that does not take place. And you do that with the proper supervision of the superintendent, and then it's a superintendent's responsibility to supervise the principals who oversee the day-to-day -day operations at every school site. But yes, I absolutely believe there's no reason why anybody cannot come to the board meeting, whether they're an employee or a citizen, and say what they want to and not be uh, retaliated against. When I was on the board before we even had, uh, the superintendent had the county council come down because we were having people coming saying different things about employees at the board meeting. And the county council explained to us, people have the right to come say what they want to. The only time you can cut them off is when they start using inappropriate language. But they have the right to say whatever they want about any employee or any uh, board member. It's a responsibility then of whoever is uh, talked about, if they feel they've been wronged, then they need to take legal action. But as far as for the employees, employees should be able to come and speak at a board meeting about anything that's on their mind without having to worry about being retaliated against. I would not stand for that as a board member. Thank you. Candidate Ubaldi, the district boasts on their website and in publications that the Beloyo Unified Schools are full-service community schools. What is your definition of a full-service community school, and does the district meet your definition? Thank you for that question. Full-service community schools to me is, my definition would be collaboration. Collaboration with in an area of health and area of um, business community, labor, are currently present in our, on our site. We offer dentists, we offer mental health, we offer varieties of program to to help with their health, healthy uh, needs so that they can be an effective and valuable participation in their learning. We also offer, sometimes community would come and offer meals that would sustain uh, the nutrition of our students. Most schools would have perhaps breakfast or lunch, 
definitely lunch, but we offer three meals a day to keep our students healthy and nourished so they can learn. We have cooperation with Kaiser. We have cooperation with Solano uh, uh, Mental Health. So those are ways of supporting our students, not just in a health, those health, healthy areas, but also we work with probation office, the county offices, to look at and help our students to become healthy and full particip participants in, their, in education. I believe in it and I support it, support it, and we have getting positive recognition from the state and also from the communities on how effective our projects have become. And so with, with that in mind, I, I, we will sustain that and continue supporting it for the sake of the fullness of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wilson. Do you support having school resource officers on school campuses? Why or why not? <coughs> I do support having resource officers, school resource officers on our campuses. Um, they are members of the police department. They are real policemen. Um, they work, uh, there has been a grand jury report that made the suggestion that we have school resource officers. We were already in negotiation prior to the grand jury report with the Vallejo police as the finances of the city and the community and our resources improve. The a police department now has more police officers, so therefore they can allow them to work at school sites. But the most important key of that is, it has to be the right police officer, one who's able to work with all students, one who's able to not overreact and use excessive force, and one that we can work with with a clear understanding that they have to work with our site safety supervisors. We have more than 40 site safety supervisors who know our kids on a daily basis, know them in the community. It has to be a collaborative effort. Right now, we're working on an MOU to put it in place, the program in place. We know that there have been 74 school shootings since Sandy Hook. Every one of those schools had school resource officers or police staff. So therefore, school resource officers are not the only answer. Full service community schools restorative justice, positive youth behavior interventions, proper training of staff, having everyone on campus, every adult is responsible for the safety of children and for the safety of staff and the employees. Our surveillance cameras, a picture is worth a thousand words whether the adult is writing the report or the student. The fencing, keeping intruders off the campuses. These are things that we were doing prior to the grand jury report. And the grand jury report's only reference was to the National Association of School Resource Officers. You read the report, they're talking about our full service community schools, restorative justice, positive behavior intervention. We were well ahead of the game. Thank you. Thank you. I'm candidate Lock Miller. It is a known fact that not every child will go to college. Years ago, schools had a vocational program that taught students skills, i.e. mechanics, welding, and hairdressing. At this time, welding is a field that many people could reap economic benefits from. 
Do you believe or would you advocate bringing back these types of programs to our high schools and why? Absolutely. College isn't for everyone. In Europe, it takes, the kids graduate from high school and they go on for public service for two years before joining university. So obviously not everybody is college bound because they don't have the interest. Having an option for a trade that will provide their family with a good living wage, the opportunity to own a home in the community they live in, to support jobs here in our own communities. Those are all very doable programs that we could institute in our district. And I believe we are instituting some of them. With the amount of union and labor support that we have in the area with the number of um, headquarters and our relationship with labor, working in partnership with labor, we should be able to get that done rather quickly sooner rather than later. I would say the same with the site resource officer program. Sooner rather than later. Do it right, but do it now. Having strong partnerships with the folks that can help guide our kids into the next generation jobs is part and parcel of those, par those partnerships. Building those relationships across the country so that families that are moving into our community or moving out can transfer those skills, that can only do good for not only our community but the rest of our state and nation. Without that level of cooperation between the unions and our district employees and programs, how can we fail? We're offering the kids things that they're interested in um, I worked with a summer school program this year that 14-year-old boys had never had a drill in their hand. So it was interesting to me this, to see their level of interest in actually getting their hands on some tools and making things. It engaged them in a way that they hadn't been engaged in in the past. Teachers came and saw what was happening and they were like, oh, that makes so much sense. These kids are engaged, they're working together as a team because I only had two drills and 12 kids. But it showed the kids something that they were good at and they could teach someone else how to do the same thing. One child taught another child and I cheered them on. All I was was the cheerleader. And that's where I think uh, we can do a be better job all across the board. Partnerships, that's what it's gonna take. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Worrell, what is your position on term limits for the school board? I'm, I'm not aware of anything out there where people want to do term limits. I think locally like this, uh, I'd be opposed to term limits. Uh, it's kind of hard to spend a whole lot of money to, to buy your way into office like they do sometimes in the state, the national level. Uh, I think enough people pay attention at the local level that I don't, I don't believe we need term, li term limitations. When you look at what's happened in the state, uh, I personally think it has hurt the state having the uh, term limit limitations. A lot of times, especially for the state, not necessarily as much local, uh, it takes a little bit longer to uh, get your feet wet and understand what's going on. It's a lot easier locally to do it, and people pay much more attention to local politics than they do to state ones. So if anybody ever proposed term limitations uh, locally, uh, for the school board, I would say no. I would be against it. Thank you. Candidate Kayang Yang, what is your opinion on term limits for school board members? I would support such an um, institution of a policy on term limits. We need to g give other people in the community the chance to serve on this school board and advocate for the community's interest. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Ubalde. School districts and communities outside of Vallejo have a uniform policy. Vallejo also has a uniform policy in some schools. Parents, however, can opt out. Do you believe that this policy should be mandatory? Why or why not? That's a hot one. <laughs> Personally speaking, I am very supportive of the uniform policy that the school district it is successful 
when people support it. But if there is non-support, it falls apart. And so it would take really an effort from the top to make that possible. And lastly, the cooperation from the family. That's where the breakdown takes place. Kids don't like uniform. They want to meet their individual identity. But, at, but most of all, it, I think it's very helpful because the cost of shoes and clothes today are so, so unreal. So I support it with, with uh, and, 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 and hopefully have the, the support from the community as a whole. And, uh, and so that's, that's where I am on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Candidate World, what's your feelings on the school uniform? You must have been reading my mind. Uh, I'm for it. I supported it when I was on the board before. I know some people say that uh, having a uniform, it, it, it stifles creativity. And I always said, those people that knew me, I wore, wore a uniform for 30 years and it never stifled my individuality. I, <laughs> I still spoke out. Uh, I, to me, it, it, it's a calming effect. Uh, you have to work with the education code, though. You need to get the parents on board. I don't think it would be that hard for this district, this board, to get out there and explain why it's good for the kids. You don't have the kids out there then trying to outdress one another. You don't have to worry about some things being uh, uh, offensive that they do wear. Uh, uh, let's face it, there's some young ladies out there and even some men, uh, <laughs> the way they dress, I don't think that's appropriate for school. And the school is run by the adults. The adults are the one that set the rules. We all need to get together and address that as best we can. And we do need, in my opinion, to come up with some type of a uniform. Uh, I went to St. Vincent's here in town for my high school. I went to public school before that. But I wore a uniform at St. Vincent's. And again, it didn't stifle any of my creativity. And I don't think of many people that did. Uh, but it is a calming effect. Uh, it's, you don't have so much of the social economics because everybody's dressed the same. So you don't have one kid trying to outdress another and the parents save a whole lot of money in uh, dressing their kids for school. And I think it's just a better, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it just makes it a better environment, I think, when people are... Uh, dress similarly, and as Ms. Wilson just said, it is a calming yes. effect for all the students, and it's easier, I think, on the teachers, too. Thank you. Um, kind of along the same, same lines, Candidate Wilson, do you agree that students at any school should be required to carry all of their books around daily and incur possible health problems? Do I need to read that again? No. That, okay, and if not, what do you suggest we do to eliminate this problem? Um, of course, we don't want children carrying all their books around daily. I, I will say with the, uh, the ed code allows the opt-out provisions, the, and that is the state ed code. Uh, it is the one that allows the opt-out provisions for the dress uh, for the uniform policy. And that's what uh, the district follows. Um, no, I do not believe the students should be required to uh, carry the books around. On, um, I believe that there should be a home set, and this is what we work toward, having a home set of books and a, a classroom set. And that, that way, they don't have to carry the books around except their notebooks, their pencils, their paper, but the textbooks are what's so heavy. So it's very important that we try and have enough textbook money so that students will have a set of textbooks that are in the classroom for their usage and one set at home so that uh, they can work on it at home, not have to bring it to school, and it's in the classroom for them also to use. Thank you. Candidate 
Locke Miller. Same question, can we have your take on that? We're in the technology age. If we had laptops for every student or tablets that we could load up electronic books on, that would save a lot of the manpower back and forth, possibly even the expense of dual book sets. Flipping the page on a book is a very visceral experience, so it's probably just as important to have the sets at, at the classroom, but if we're able to buy home sets, I'm thinking dollar for dollar, we would do just as well with the electronic tablets. I'm hopeful that there's enough partnerships down in the South Bay that we can build that perhaps Oracle or HP or somebody could supply those for us, or at least give us a break because of the volume. But let's harness the power of technology. That's one reason we need the upgrades, um, so that the whiteboards in the, in the classes, it's all interactive these days. Let's take advantage of that. Security-wise, they can be built in with enough adult controls so that the kids aren't on sites that they shouldn't be on. Um, it just makes financial sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached the point where the next two questions that I'm going to ask, each one of you will get it. But before we go there, um, we can allow, based on time, we can allow three questions from the audience. If, so, if um, Pat Basin will get your question, did you write it down or you want to ask it out loud? Okay. Three questions from three different people. And we will be respectful. There was some discussion about the uh, fiscal impact of, of uh, students not uh, attending on a daily basis to, this, uh, to their school campus. And um, we also we had discussion about uh, bullying and um, assault and involving um, police on, you know, on school campuses. My question is, what do you think are the root causes of why students are not excited to attend school on their own accord, on their, out of their own interests that are being uh, reflected in the schools that they're supposed to be attending? And what are the, and how, are, how is that coupled with them uh, acting out and bullying or assaulting people in uh, positions of authority. Okay, so I think that was all three questions in one. I'm not sure. <laughs> so what are, the root, what are the root causes for students not being excited? That's one question. We... And what, and what um, in, your, in your expertise, your background, how do you, how do you feel that you could be instrumental in addressing those root causes of why students are not feeling represented or engaged or excited about their education. Okay, so since I said one question, three questions, three different people, there's two questions on the floor. I, didn't, I don't see that you addressed it to any one person. So if one of the candidates want to take it on, you can answer both questions or you can answer one, your choice. Canada world. <laughs> <laughs> to me, most kids in elementary school want to go to school. It's when they start getting up into middle school and high schools where some of them don't want to go. It, to me, it's, it's not just one simple problem. Uh, a lot of, the bullying is learned. It's not inherited. It's not in our DNA. It's learned. Uh, part of the problem is the parents... Let's face it, a lot of parents aren't engaged with their kids as they should be. Uh, so that falls on the school to, to provide that type of leadership. Uh, also, with social media today, my God, people don't know how to speak to one another. It's becoming a lost art because all we do is, is text one another. And when you're texting someone, you can say one thing and somebody takes it another way. But we need to have programs in place so when kids start acting out, that we can teach them the proper way to act. Because, as I said, a lot of people are not getting that at home. Some people want to say, oh, it's all, it's, it's, it should be left up to the parents, it should be left up to the parents. 
education isn't the same as when Eva and I went to school. It's changed a lot since those days. And so we need to have programs. I've talked about this before. One of the best programs we have in this district is the Willie B. Atkins program. Uh, the, the restorative justice is good. That came from the criminal justice system. It didn't come from the schools. It came from the criminal justice system. But the Willie B. Atkins program teaches the kids how to be good citizens. The restorative justice, we will always need it because there's always going to be some kids that don't uh, do the right thing. So we need that. But I think we need to put more money into the front end of the problem, which is teaching our kids how to study and how to be good and productive citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wilson, your light's on. Ye yes. I think that we have addressed the issue in some ways with our new curriculum. The focus, the STEAM focus, the wall-to-wall -wall academies. I agree with Mr. Worrell that kids are, ex are generally excited to go to school um, in the elementary grades. <coughs> but again, we have enhanced that further because we have K-8 STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics curriculum. One of the things about at the middle school, we don't have enough activities for the students. So I am personally working on getting a grant that, a long-term grant, that will offer middle school sports, middle school activities for male and females and to enhance our after school programs. It will have a academic component for eligibility. We will hire coaches from the community and teachers, but it's very important that we engage the students at that age because that is where we're losing our students, at the middle school level. I am personally working on that particular grant. Thank you. Thank you, and I see three more lights. Dr. Baldwin. Okay. <laughs> I believe that meeting the interest of our diverse student body is very, very important. We have developed our wall-to-wall -wall academy to meet the needs and interests of our students. We have the Health and Fitness Academy, Biotech Academy, Hospitality Academy, Engineering Academy, Visual and Performing Arts Academy, Biomedical Academy, Green Academy, International Finance, Multimedia, Law Academy, and Culinary Arts Academy. The diversity of that keeps the interests of our students in school. One example that has really been very excited, exciting in our in our at Wall to Wall Academy is the Law Academy. If you have any interest in becoming a lawyer, there is a seamless direction. Once you finish high school, you can go to community college. Solano has accepted that program. You can go to four-year college, which they also have cooperated and worked with us, collaborated with us. And we also have currently two or three law schools. I am currently involved in a multimedia academy and we're working on that same, same direction. After high school, we would work with a community college here in Solano and then move toward a four-year college. And we have initiated that conversation with San Francisco State University. These are the exciting programs that are keeping our students. That's why we have high ADA. That's why we're maintaining and very, very low 
numbers of kids leaving school today because we are providing those Thank you. In interesting programs. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, I think one of the reasons why our kids, um, when they reach middle school and high school age, uh, and speaking from experience, we feel confused. We don't know who we are when we get there. And, and doing my homework, um, when I was serving on the college board um, a couple of years ago, uh, a fellow teacher from Vallejo told me this idea about ethnic studies and bring it to the school district. Two years later, it's not here. It's not fully implemented. As your school board member, I'm going to advocate for full implementations of an ethnic studies program in our district, Slim, similar to Tucson Unified School District and now recently El Monte School District in LA County. It has been documented. It increases attendance rates. It gets students more excited to come to school, decreases the dropout rate, suspensions, expulsions, but more important, it prepares our students for college. And I can tell you, speaking from experience as attending Berkeley, my fellow peers have taken ethnic studies courses at their fellow school district, and I'm gonna advocate for full implementation to solve the root causes. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Luckmill, your light's on? Yes, it is. Project-based learning is something that I found very engaging to watch the kids do. So I can only imagine what it feels like for the kids that are actually doing those projects. For them to generate their own ideas and see them from start to finish, that's true engagement. It's not a parent doing the project for them, but it's the child actually directing their own learning with the support of a, of a teacher and other adults in the classroom. For me, that's, that's almost a root cause, uh, or that's definitely a root cause is student engagement. And if we're losing their attention because of all the technology and everybody's like on the fast track, they're doing multitasking all the time, we have to allow them the freedom to do what they're already doing, but guide them with the projects. Something else with ADA that comes to mind is we have a, a vast cultural diversity in this city and we have um, folks that leave the country for weeks on end and take their children with them. And how do we recapture the ADA that's <clears throat> lost from that? Um, I think that would be worth looking at is how do we uh, get credit for maybe the, hum the homeschooling that could happen while they're out of country um, so that we can maintain the financial stability but honor the needs of the family as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more. Could each of you address the measure E, whether you specifically support it or not? Each did not ask the question of one, so we could run, if, if, if the candidates will, would you run through right quick, yes or no, and why? We could start at your end. Okay. Candidate Wilson. Yes, I, of course, endorse Measure E. Um, obviously, because it's needed for our students. Berkey already, Candidate Worrell already answered. Lock Miller, you answered earlier, but maybe they didn't catch it. I, I support it. I endorse it. I'm on the committee. I would really like to see it pass. I understand that it is a big ask but with a proper oversight and a lot of community engagement to make sure that our projects are on time, delivered on time, on budget, and to the quality that we demand, um, that would be my preferred uh, direction. Candidate. I would, <laughs> I would only support uh, Measure E, the almost quarter of a billion dollar bond with new board members that'll be transparent and accountable with the money public, based on talking with several members of the public for the past several weeks and, and this past summer, public confidence is fragile right now. And with electing new board members, they can work hard to rebuild public confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Ubalde. We have had no school bond in 17 years. This is why our school needed badly. The average school bonds in the state, in each, in each district, they average four to five years, and they have measures. 
and we have not had any in 17 years. That is outrageous. I am supportive of Measure E, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next two questions each I'm asking each of you, um, I'll state it one time, and if I need to restate it, just let me know. Candidate Wilson, in your introduction, you may have answered this question, but it bears repeating. Why are you running for the school board, and what is the one personal attribute you bring to the board, you could bring to the board? I bring an obvious attribute. <laughs> the school board should show parity to the, with the community. My 38 years as a large corporate audit manager, it is no accident that we have 3.5% reserve. It is no accident that we have a positive, qualified rating. It is no accident that anything to do with the finances, that I have not been a part of it. I go to the audit opening, to the interim meetings, save the district a million dollars because I knew that we should not go accept a sampling from the auditors, but go actual when reviewing an area. And I bring it because the biggest passion are my four grandsons and every other student, every other child in this district. I am passionate. I didn't just jump up here. I went to school board meetings before I first got on the board. And I continue to work for children. My four grandsons. Thank you. Candidate Worrell. As I did say earlier, I'm running because I care about not only the students, but this entire community. As a 30-year veteran of the police department, I understand what a good education means. You don't see a lot of uh, people in the prisons that had a good education. Well, you do see them, but they're in the, they're in the uh, club med prisons that are the feds. <laughs> but we don't want to see any of our kids end up in jail, end up in any type of trouble, let alone go, go to jail. That's why the way to keep kids out of trouble is to provide them with a good, solid education. We need to have support for the kids. As I've stated many times, we need to expand on the program of the Willie B. Atkins pro uh, program. It's been here for over 20 years. It has a track record. There's no reason why we cannot uh, make that a larger program to make it better for all of our students in this community. I guess the one attribute I bring is I'm good at listening. And I'm not only good at listening, I'm good at hearing what people say and acting on what they say. I may not always agree what you say, but if you can uh, argue with me and prove I'm wrong, I've got no problem saying, oh, okay, I missed that. You are right, and change my opinion. So I do listen to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Lockmore Miller. Why am I running? I have no children. I'm a relative newcomer to the community, but I value what Vallejo has done and I value what Vallejo is becoming. Without supporting our, our young people, we're never going anywhere. I've been working on the ground, at the school sites, at the farm, on nutrition programs, in our, in our community for the last four years. I went back to school myself at the age of 50 to complete a dream of being a nutrition educator. I've been growing food and feeding our kids and watching them grow as they're growing their own food. It's very, very personal. Our kids deserve the people on the board that can give them the time, commitment, dedication, and passion 
to see them succeed. The one personal attribute that I believe will be the biggest asset should I win a seat on the board is my diligence and my vision. I have a vision of our community rising again and being the leader in the country. We've gone through the gamut and we're coming back. I want to be a part of it. I decided that the school board is where I could have the greatest benefit and leverage the experience that I brought from the corporate world to do far more than I can do alone. With the help of the board and the teachers in this district, I think our kids are going to be fine. We just need to keep plugging away at it, bit by bit by bit. Building momentum is where we're at right now. Let's hit that tipping point and accelerate the learning in our schools. I'm committed to doing that. 40, 50, 60 hours a week, it's nothing new to me. Thank you. Thanks. Candidate Kuyang Yang. Thank you. I'm running because I am passionate of public education. In addition to serving on a college board and a city youth commission and being involved in the community for many years, I even um, spoke in front of the state senate committees on education advocating for increase in public education, such as Senate Bill 1017, and it, it may pass this year. In addition, I'm the, I have the recent experience of being a Vallejo student, and now my younger brother, a recent graduate, who's, who has the most recent experience. I was surprised to find out when he graduated, um, he had to take remedial classes at the community college, be, even though he graduated in the top 20% of his class and, and, and involved in one of the great academies our district has right now. That should not happen to any student. No one should be pushed through the system like many other of our students. I'm going to advocate for change on the board as your, as your school board member. We've even been assaulted and bullied ourselves. I'm not going to let another student be bullied or assaulted ever again. I'm your candidate for change. I'm going to insist on school safety, making sure our decisions are transparent, and ensuring that our decisions are in the best interests of the community. And also, advocate for fresh ideas that you bring forward, like ethnic studies. I'm your candidate for change. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Ubaldi. I believe that the role of the Board of Trustees is to listen and to open doors. I know that 75% of our students are marginalized because they're economically marginalized. 25% of our students will do well wherever and whatever they do. So my passion, where my heart is right now, is dealing with students who are affected by poverty, racism, inequality, marginalization, immigration, mental health, poor health, ignorance. I feel very privileged this past three years to participate in uplifting and empowering these particular numbers of students that we have. I have enjoyed and appreciated working with the outstanding trustees who have the same passion and commitment dealing with these who are marginalized and an excellent superintendent who understand the needs of this particular segment of our community. 25% are successful and they will always succeed. But we need priority to sustain those who, are, who are, are vulnerable. That is why I am here. This is why I want to continue and support the current program that is showing success and affirmation of all the students. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to change it up. The last question, I'm going to read the question. You have one minute to give us an answer, OK? We have heard many statements from you tonight, and we appreciate your comments. But tell us what you believe should be the board's number one priority 
if you become a Vallejo City Unified School District board meeting. One minute, and we'll start with candidate Ubaldi. Wow. It's obvious that this, this board, current board, is not a do-nothing board. And I want to continue the progress that has taken place in our school district. My number one, number one priority, again, are those students who are marginalized and will work toward to empower them to be the best that they can be. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Kanyang Yang. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming here tonight to listen to, the, to um, what we have to share tonight. Thank you to my fellow candidates for sharing their platform, and thank you to the organizers of organizing this. Number, as your board member, the number one thing I would advocate for when elected at the first board meeting later this year is school safety. I talked to a grandparent um, a couple weeks ago. His nephew had his ear severed being attacked from behind. He went to that, she went to the administration to get a resolution. Nothing was done about it. I'm not gonna let that student fall through the cracks again. I'm gonna insist at every board meeting, our schools must be safe. I'm gonna insist on progress reports and, and follow up that, that no one should be assaulted or bullied again. I'm gonna ask the tough questions every board meeting. How's our schools doing? Is our schools safe? I'm going to advocate for you and stand up for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Candidate Lock Miller. First and foremost is to maintain our financial stability and continue to move in the proper direction. With a 3.5% reserve, that's great. But for the long term, we just need to make sure that we're spending the money as effectively as we can. In order to attract and retain the quality teachers, that we need to serve our kids, that's a must. If we don't have the dollars and we're not paying attention to every penny, we don't go anywhere. So fi financial stability, extreme vigilance, so that we can attract and retain quality employees. Thank you. Candidate Worrell. <clears throat> to me, the number one priority is to provide a good education for all of our students. Now, to get that, it entails a lot of things. You have to have uh, good, clean school sites. You need to have school safety. You need to have good employees that you respect, respect and treat fairly. So that would be my number one priority is, is, is the education, good education for everybody. But it's more than just a good education. To get that, you have to do all the other items uh, including the financial stability. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wilson. An outstanding education from the Child Development Center, preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, and the adult school. School safety, listening, hiring, training, our employees, good compensation for our employees, accountability, transparency, and of course, my biggest one, fiscal responsibility. So, on November the 2nd, you're going to... That was easy. Hazel Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to take this time to remind you Besides the candidates that are running on the ballot, we have Measure E. If you care about our kids, um, we need your support. Um, candidate Ubaldi was a bond commissioner 17 years ago. I served on that, and there was accountability, believe me. But think about our kids. I would encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to fill out one of them little orange forms back there to say you endorse it. Also, I would like to remind you about PB, participatory budgeting. You know, the voting goes all next week. This was your money. And we have projects out there that 
the community determined was appropriate. You need to vote. Um, you have your school board candidates, you have your community college candidates, you need to vote, please vote. And I want to thank you for coming and I want to thank the candidates for taking time out their busy schedule and coming to the forum. Thank you and good night.